this week on the Back Table Podcast. Um, and so, yeah, I would say a couple of things. So prostate embolization is, is one, I think, a must-have uh, for a PAE program. Um, we've done a, a small handful of cases, and we've really just sort of lacked motivation to scale this. But we've done, <laughs> uh, yeah, just to be honest, we've done gastrostomy tubes, and we've, we've sort of ironed out a protocol where we get a referral with no cross-sectional imaging. And yeah. we drop an NG tube and get an on-the-table cone beam, which I think is a really effective way of both feeling confident that you're not tracking through something you don't want to track through with your access, but also expediting care. And so cone beam is a, you know, is, is, is sort of got a budding role for that in our practice. Hey guys, and welcome to the Back Table Podcast, your source for all things IR and endovascular. I'm Chris Beck. I'll be your host today. Per usual, we're always on the lookout for more feedback. So if you have some, reach out to us on the website, www.backtable.com, or hit us up on Twitter. Our handle is at underscore backtable. Don't forget the underscore before backtable. First off, I would like to thank our sponsor, Radpad. We appreciate the support, guys. Radpad was developed by physicians for physicians. It's clinically proven radiation protection during DSA and all your fluoro guided procedures. Don't bet your career or your health on anything less. Trust RadPad radiation protection shields for all your fluoro guided interventions. Check out radpad.com for more information or reach out to these guys at info at radpad.com for a free radiation evaluation and no brainer radiation protection cap. And make sure you tell them that uh, you heard this on Back Table Podcast. So with that out of the way, I'm happy to introduce our topic today. Today, we're going to be talking about cone beam CT. With that said, let's introduce today's guest. We have today, interventional radiologist, Austin Bourgeois. Austin, would you uh, introduce yourself and just tell us a little bit about your practice? Sure, yeah. Thanks for having me. So our practice is in Huntsville, Alabama. It's a private practice. And the main site for our interventional is at a thousand bed hospital it's not a transplant center. It's a level one trauma center, and it's located 90 miles south of Nashville where there's Vanderbilt for transplant and 90 miles north of UAB where they have transplant services as well. And so we're in an area that's about 180 miles between transplant centers, and our catchment area is a little less than a million people. Uh, we see a wow. lot of oncology patients, and a big part of my efforts in my practice is oncologic intervention. That sounds awesome. So I know we, we've talked before, but just on a, on a given or maybe one week or month, will you uh, give everyone an idea of like how many um, uh, radio embolization procedures you do on maybe a week or a month basis? Yeah. So we, in a given year, are around 150 treatments for liver-directed therapies, and that's everything, but we've got a big bias towards Y90 for a lot of reasons, uh, their workflow reasons, and also um, personal preferences among myself and my colleagues. Nice. Nice. So pretty good volume. Um, all right. So let's get into the topic. So I, I brought you on, um, because, uh, we were connected through a mutual friend that you do a lot of comb beam CT for all your liver interventions. And so we're going to kind of get into that, but first off, I thought we could just talk about some of the things that you use comb beam CT for. I know we've already mentioned liver directed therapy, but I didn't know if you used comb beam for anything else like body things uh, like celiac plexus block or maybe I've seen people presented at like difficult uh, nephrostomy tube access and prostate artery embolization. Do you use uh, comb beam for anything else besides uh, liver directed therapy? Yeah. And so uh, that's a really good question. The majority and I would say about 90 or more percent of what we use it for is related to liver directed therapy or the occasional problem solving in angiograms like GI bleeds, for example. Um, We put a few drains in in angio and we use cone beam. Um, I have done a couple transgastric pseudocyst drains using cone beam CT. Uh, We have dabbled with a couple cases of vertebral augmentation using cone beam CT and and trajectory planning. Um, And so a little of this, a little of that, but a big part, like we mentioned, if we're doing 150 liver cases, we maybe cone beam, including the treatments, we cone beam on average three to six times per case. And so uh, the lion's share of the actual number of procedures, uh, which may be seven or 800 a year, uh, come from uh, the Y90 treatments and planning sessions. 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, so let's talk about first just things that like tips and tricks for audience members to think about whenever they're getting their room and or their patient set up. Uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll kind of unpack a few uh, answers there. So um, I, I think probably the most important thing we do is we do a lot of it. And it's the expectation that for every mapping, every treatment, every taste, every bland embolization, and a few other procedures here and there, there's just going to be a cone beam. And so the nurses are sort of beyond the initial learning curve, which I think is kind of the hard part, right? The first maybe 10 to 20 cases where uh, you go in the room and everybody's confused and upset with you because you're asking to get arms up. Um, we're, we're kind of at a point where the expectation is for every liver case, we're going to be doing it. And so IVs are accessible uh, and in locations that they're not prone to kink when the arms move. Um, the patients are already positioned so that they can get their arms up pretty easy. We don't restrain patients. Um, we sedate really lightly and the nurses know that on the front end. I tend to give every patient a warning on the front end and in recovery when we see them in clinic beforehand, but also the day of the procedure, we say, hey, uh, we're going to ask you to hold your breath. And the, the line I use is uh, the imaging equipment we have is kind of like a digital camera, except for it acquires an image over the course of about five or six seconds. And so we're going to need you to hold your breath. And for that reason, and also because this procedure doesn't really hurt that much, we're going to sedate you really lightly. So you're going to be awake. We're going to be talking to you. We're going to need you to hold your breath. And I kind of give everybody before they get sedated a heads up of sort of what we're trying to accomplish so that when I give them the specific instructions in the room, they at least have a pretty good idea as to sort of what we're doing and why. Um, and I would say, you know, going back to just the sheer volume, uh, mm -hmm. I think that's probably the secret sauce. You know, if you have the expectation with your staff, then you know, then I think it makes it a whole lot easier on everybody and you get better at it as you go. And, you know, I never really consider myself an expert on this at all, but I've sent some images around and uh, had people say, wow, those look, you know, better, better than, than I've seen other ones look. And, and I think they probably look better because we just do a ton of them. And I think that's, that's probably the main thing is just getting over the initial learning curve. Yeah, absolutely. I think getting a lot of reps in for the interventionalists and also the staff is, is key. And, and like you said, there's that learning curve of the first 15 or 20 times you actually do it where everyone's kind of looking around, no one really knows what to do. And then once you kind of get over that hump and everyone gets trained up on it and the expectation is that you're going to do the cone beam CT and, and you know, mm -hmm. you, you've tackled that hurdle of like, this is just something we're going to do. Then everyone kind of gets on board and falls into line. So when it, also th this is something that's come up whenever you have the C arm in position, uh, for liver treatments, is it always at the head of the patient or do you put it to the side of the patient? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And so, I um, mean, I'll answer that. And, and so all of our spins are all, uh, we don't do a prop spin. It's all a, a side spin. And so it's a, I think it's a minus 120 to plus 120 uh, a spin from the side. And that's because we do femoral access. And I didn't, I didn't answer uh, specifically your last question, but so what we found, we've got Siemens equipment. We've got the standard sort of middle of the road, Artist Z Siemens equipment in mm -hmm. a few rooms. And it gets, I think, really good quality cone beams. Um, and um, the, the issue that we found is that in our patient size and our average patient population, it's really difficult to position somebody so that you can see the right aspect of the abdomen for a liver, a liver case and get accurate volumes with a left with left arm down basically and so because of that uh, we've tried i want to say maybe a dozen cases or so of radial access for mappings and for treatments um don't completely rule out radial access we use it in people that have uh that we need to position in a way to make them a little bit more comfortable like if we have to prop the head of the bed up for for copd sometimes we'll use uh radial access if somebody really has issues with pain tolerance or laying flat or back pain patients with um, occasional spinal mets. Um, those are people that we would consider radial access for, but I'm going to say about 90% of what we do is femoral access and the spins come from the standard II position that you would for a, a, a standard DSA run. Okay. So, and that's with the, the prop spins or the, uh, the C arm at the head of the patient. Yeah. The C arms at the side. Oh, you yeah, have the so C arm at the side. Yeah. So it's that, 90 degrees orthogonal. Does, does that slow down? Um, your spin or is the spin the same, whether you have it in the head of the position or the side of the position? Yeah. So for us, we uh, start off our mappings with the patient's arms down. 
And so again, mm-hmm. femoral access, arms down. And when I get the microcatheter in about the right position, uh, I tell the nurses, hey, let's set up for a spin. And so the nurses at the head of the bed simultaneously um, get the arms up and get them positioned, which everything else is pretty much has been pre-checked before I come in the room. And at the same time, the techs at the uh, foot end of the bed are hooking up the injector and setting the parameters on it. And so we've kind of got the timing down on getting everything ready simultaneously from kind of the standard angio position with the C-arm from the side. And so it really doesn't take us any longer, but that's just, again, repetition. Actually, my question was, is this the the timing of the actual C arm spin the same regardless if you had it at the head or at the side, like the spin takes still, I, usually it's between five and six seconds. The spin will go just as fast in the prop position as it will from the side of the patient, depending on what system you have. And even there's some variability within, you know, whether you have Siemens or Phillips, I'm sure they have different, you know, C arms, which do different spins. But for my, for my table, the spins are actually faster when the C arms at the head of the uh, mm. head of the bed and so we do almost everything with the C-arm at the head of the bed because it shaves off two seconds mm. from the spin. Um, so what, do you, what are your spin parameters, if you don't mind me asking? And how long, I guess, how long does an acquisition take? And what, what uh, is it Phillips manufacturer you have? Yes, Phillips. And the spin will take, I think, 5.2 seconds when it's at the head of the patient and then when it's mm. in the side. And it can only be done on the patient's left side. Like if we were to move, like for some reason, if I was to go left femoral access and whatever, I wanted to work from the left side of the patient. If I pull the machine over onto the right ha- or right side of the patient, it will not do a spin from that position. So it's, it's a little bit nuanced. And I think that the spin, if I do it when it's at the side position takes seven seconds, seven seconds flat. Yeah. And so to cover kind of my general thoughts on it, um, I think you bring up a really, really good point. And that is that all of these, you know, this is best covered probably in podcast format because uh, this is this is really about what equipment you have and what parameters you can uh, get with your, your existing software package and hardware. And those are highly variable among sites. And so you've got Siemens, which is what we use. Uh, like I said, we use sort of the medium, the, the Artist Z. And uh, you get the Dyna CT with that. With Phillips, you've got Expert CT. They kind of have their all own proprietary names. And the, the formulation and the reconstruction is all a little bit different among equipment. Um, and I think that that sort of brings up the, the sort of main variables in them, other than your equipment, which you can't change in, in most situations. Right, um, right. You know, there's there's sort of a few, a small handful of variables that you that you can change, and um, and I think you bring up a good point. And so my from our previous conversation on this, one of the things I've really become convinced from tinkering with our different settings is that we have what was sort of referred to as a high dose and a low dose CT parameter. And the high dose was six second acquisition, the low dose was a four second acquisition. And I've tried them both, and I've tried them both with the same injection rate, catheter position, and in the same artery, and. And what I found is that really uh, the interesting thing is that the six second acquisition oftentimes looks a lot worse than the four second acquisition. And what I've sort of settled on is that, like you mentioned, it's a lot less about the number of photons, meaning the amount of time and the amount of frames that you're taking and a lot more about motion when it comes to cone beam CT. And so you've got the, the, the shortest, in my opinion, the shortest uh, spin time that you can come up with in general is going to be the most effective for the intensive purposes of, of liver directed therapy. And that's getting volumes and looking for non-target embolization. In terms of breathing maneuvers, is it right to assume that you do everyone with a breath hold and at end expiration? Yeah. So what we found is there's a whole lot more reproducibility in end expiration. And so And I think most people would probably agree with that for the abdomen. Uh, So what we do is we have the patient breathe in once, breathe out, and then hold. And I always sort of religiously, the first time we do it, practice with them. And the practice is to sort of wake them up, one, from the sedation, uh, two, to make sure that they know what we're doing, and then uh, three, to make sure that I get my timing down. And it sort of found that everybody, you know, the, the... the start time, if we, uh, and we'll get into our, our parameters here, I guess, in a, in a minute, but if I'm doing an eight-second injection delay, 
what I've usually found is it's starting the breath hold process, breathe in, breathe out and hold at around six seconds um, with six seconds remaining in your injection delay mm-hmm. tends to be about the right time. Some people may be a little bit uh, a deeper breathers. It takes longer and some people shorter. And so that helps kind of time up that as a reference. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Like the timing of the delay and, and making sure that you have them breath holding as you're starting the spin, right? Um, yeah. Going back to the room patient setup, just to make sure to have everything. So usually or typically femoral access, the C-arm is on the side of the patient, so left side. And then you have an IV set up usually in an area that's not going to get kinked or difficult to access um, whenever they go, you know, arms down versus arms up where they have to bend their elbows is there anything special you do with the IV tubing or the blood pressure cuff or the oxygen tubing to, to keep it out of the way of the C-arm? You know, the only thing we do is we make sure ahead of time that it is in a position where it's going to not get in the way. And because we're not doing a prop spin, it tends to not get tangled at the head of the bed. Right. Um, and spinning from the side, it, they generally will put, the nurses will put the cuff on the left arm and the IV in the left arm. And yes. And then they just bring the left arm. They physically manipulate the left arm up over their head when it comes time to get ready for the spin. And so it's not really that um, uh, that involved, at least with our setup. Right. And then always arm boards out and then arms up for all the spins, right? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, as far as anesthesia, I'll just throw out one tip that uh, I've, I've also kind of moved towards in my Y90 mappings is that a lot of these now I'm doing just with local and I, I thought, I mean, I have a patient population, uh, patient population that is really resistant to this, but I found that the guys in the, in the female patients that are doing these liver directed therapies for, you know, these cancer treatments there, as long as I talk to them about it ahead of time and I let them know what to expect, they they've all been good with it. And I just emphasize that, you know, it's important to get these pictures right. I would love to, I'd love to put you to sleep for every procedure and make it, you know, like you went to bed and then woke up after, but I just emphasize how important it is, is it is. And, you know, people have been very responsive and they, and they just tell me, you know, do what you got to do. It, you know, it's all, it becomes more about like treating this cancer. And if I tell them that's like a critical part of it, they seem okay with it. And, and the reality is that the procedure is really not painful. So as long as like, you know, they're numb very well up to the femoral artery, um, you know, people do really well with this. I don't know if that's been your experience also. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. My experience would mirror yours. And, you know, and when I, when I see somebody in consultation, I try to lay the foundation for this. And we talk a lot about how Y90 is one of many options. It's the option that tends to make you the least sick. And I think there's a lot of, uh, of how you present it, or at least how you sort of sell it to patients. And I sort of refer to the procedure as the part that you feel is just an IV placement in the artery and the IV takes about two minutes to place. You don't feel anything else. The worst part's just laying on the table and we can give you pain medicine if you get uncomfortable. And so, yeah, I agree with you. You know, we tend to give, I don't know, I'm going to say maybe at least uh, 100 mics of fentanyl and two milligrams of Versed over the course of a case. But patients are far from, you know, really sedated. Right. Yep. Um, so moving on to equipment, equipment and slash or contrast. Will you tell everyone a little bit about uh, what you do for contrast and uh, the dilution, if any, that you use for your patients? Yeah. So, uh, so for us, we we approach it a little bit different for the mappings. If we're if we're segueing strictly into liver directed therapy, uh, we approach it a little bit different for the mappings as we do for the treatments. And so for the mappings. Sure. Um, I'm really focused on the parenchymal phase on tumor enhancement, and I'm trying to get a few data points. One, which artery goes where? Um, two, I'm trying to get parenchymal staining for volume calculation um, because we're, we're, we have a big bias towards glass uh, using Therosphere. Sure, so you're and, beforehand, right? Yeah, and, um, and so we, you know, we're looking for parenchymal phase staining um, for where the arteries are heading, and then we're also looking for relative contrast enhancement. And that, that's somewhat of an eye test because, mm-hmm. um, you know, we, we're not using spec CT. We're not strictly calculating tube normal uptake ratios and using partition modeling in the dosimetry calculations. Mm-hmm. But I do sort of anecdotally weigh in how hypervascular tumors appear both angiographically and on cone beam as to 
how much dose we can get away with and what the normal liver toxicity is going to be from a certain average absorbed dose. And so we're going for half and half contrast on our mappings because of that. And again, we're looking mainly for parenchymal staining. And so if we have a heavier patient, which I I would have known from either seeing them that morning or from clinic, then I may Mm -hmm. bump it up for the mapping to two third strength. But we're typically in the half strength to two third strength contrast uh, for the mappings. For, okay, and so there's, and there's very few situations where you're diluting even further past that, right? Yeah, I can't think of a time. Maybe somebody with chronic kidney disease who happens to be really thin. That might be okay. a situation where I might go third strength. But those are really rare, really, really right. rare. Few and far. Uh, so aside from contrast dilution uh, along the equipment vein, um, what are you using for – I don't know if it's worth talking about your, your base or your end hole catheter. And, uh, but I think it is worth talking about like what you're using for your micro catheter. Yeah. So that's one of the things that I've, I've felt pretty strongly about over the past couple of years is the, uh, the PSI injection rate that you get. And so I use a, we're, we're a Boston size shop. We have a lot of Boston size equipment and mm-hmm. we also have very few, I guess, compared to a lot of private practice, we have very few budgetary constraints. And so our standard oh, micro catheter, uh, yeah, f- yeah, for uh, for Y90 and really for anything is a, is a direction microcatheter, and it's pressure rated up to 1,200 psi. And we've noticed that when you crank the psi up to 11 or 1,200, which we routinely do for our comb beams, then you end up getting, I think, a little bit better flow rate. And so my standard mapping microcatheter, unless I know I'm getting really distal and I know I'm planning for a a peripheral segmentectomy. Uh, I'm heading for an 027 direction, and it's got, a, I think, a six. So you can get a maximum six per second injection rate off of it, if I remember right. Okay. That's great. And then, uh, like you said, you always have the PSI at 1,100, 1,200? Yeah. Yeah, somewhere in that range. And that's the uh, staff sort of know that that's the the range we're looking for for the microcatheter, and then we bump it down for uh, the base catheter if we ever spin with that. And so if you're doing femoral access, is, is your microcatheter length 110 or 130? Yeah, no, that's a good point. And uh, yeah, so we use a 130 microcatheter, and I feel like the shorter the microcatheter, uh, the better the fluid dynamics are working in your favor and you get better flow rates. And, um, and that may be one thing that contributes to, I think, a little bit better cone beam quality, not using a 150 from the wrist. Um, again, it's kind of semantics, but I think it helps a little bit. Um, okay, so let's talk about some of the cone beam CT variables. So we we talked a little bit, or, or we kind of touched on acquisition time. Um, will you talk a little bit about, I guess, the scan time, like the actual time it takes to spin, and then also the delay from when the contrast injection starts and then when the spin starts? Do you know what I mean? Yeah, so our delays may be a little bit more delayed than a lot of people. So we do a parenchymal phase. And so my, my sort of standard is an eight second delay. And, um, and like we've talked about before, you know, this is kind of arbitrary. And so I, I'll, right. I'll do a hand injection again, things for us for private practice or sort of high volume in terms of our, our, our angio setup. We, each person tries to get through 15 to let's low twenties, a uh, number of cases a day. And so everything is geared towards efficiency and um and so what my game plan is i take a five french catheter up as distal as i can get it and usually a cobra and i'll i'll try to get that out in the proper hepatic and take some images with that and then from there everything else is hand injected and so i'll ballpark based on the flow rate from the hand injection and if it looks about normal then i'll go for an eight second x-ray delay so our standard would be for a right lobe might be somewhere in the ballpark of a, a 2.5 cc for 25 with an eight second delay. And for a left lobe, it might be a one for 10 with an eight second delay. If it looks a little bit more sluggish, like somebody who's colorectal, heavily pretreated, mm-hmm. might extend the x-ray delay up into even the you know, 10, 12 second range to try to get good parenchymal staining. And if it's a really hypervascular tumor or I'm trying to get more of a CTA, then I'll bump it down to four or five seconds. Okay. So metastatic colorectal, longer delay, somewhere between eight and 12 second delay from when the contrast starts going in. The, in the eight, 12 second delay, to be clear, is when the contrast injection starts, there's eight or 12 seconds that lapse, and then the cone beam CT starts. And so there, there's an additional, uh, with you, four more seconds 
Right. Right. I'm sorry. Yeah. If that makes no. sense. So let me go back. So to summarize, the the delay that we're talking about is the delay between when the contrast injection starts and the cone beam CT starts. So if you're saying an eight to twelve second delay, injection starts, there's an eight to twelve second delay, and that's when the cone beam CT kicks in, right? That's exactly right. Yeah. And so you're looking to your point, if you're you're looking at an eight second delay and a four second acquisition, then it's twelve seconds afterwards that your cone beam CT would be finished. Okay, great. And then just to go back and, and recap a little bit, if you have an eight second delay, the contrast injection is going, you can see the, the timer counting down and it's six seconds. That's when you say, hey, take that breath in, blow it out. And then by the time eight seconds hits, your patient's at end expiration and the cone beam's kicking in. Exactly. Yeah. And so if it's, let's say a 12 second delay, I wait six seconds till it ticks down to around six and then I start breathing them. Okay, great. Um, and right, to, so to go about, back, oh, go ahead. Start, yeah, no, I was going to mention, you know, one thing I didn't mention a, a minute ago was, um, so I was talking about the acquisition delay time. And so one thing I said, so we go 50, 50 or two thirds contrast for mappings, but for treatments, I like to go a hundred percent and it's a little unique or I guess strange to map on the, I mean, to, uh, to cone beam on the day of a, a treatment, if you've already had sure. a recent mapping within a week or so, but it's just kind of one of the checklist OCD things I do. I think it gets everybody thinking cone beam. It makes it more efficient overall. And it kind of gives me a little peace of mind that I'm not missing a super duodenal or, or right gastric branch. Um, and so I, I tend to get a cone beam before I inject in my injection position. Um, and what I found from that is that, uh, you know, very rarely do you find something that you missed in terms of accessory or aberrant perfusion to the bowel. Sure. But a lot of what you will pick up are, okay, my catheter is sort of at the end of a loop of tortuosity. If I pull it back a little bit, I'll sort of get more even distribution within the artery. Instead of sending all the beads into the posterior branch, maybe I'll evenly distribute them if I pull back or push in. And so it kind of really helps me feel comfortable with the flow dynamics within where my microcatheter is positioned, which it's hard to get identical to your mapping. And, uh, and that's one of the things I've found doing that. So we do at least one spin for every injection on the day of treatment as well. And you know, when what, we were talking about this topic beforehand, and then you told me you did cone beam, the CT, uh, cone beam CT the day of your treatment, and we kind of dug into this, I thought that was really interesting. And I think it's something that when you're doing a really high volume, it's, it's one of the small nuances that you pick up on is that, you know, being at a slightly different point in the vessel, even though you're, you're past all of the vessels that can, you know, potentially non-target embolization. And so you would think like there's not a big difference between, you know, being at the, the head of the loop versus, you know, a centimeter back. But I think there, that's, I think a lot of us see that like on DSA. And I think it's very interesting that you get the cone beam CT then to evaluate the actual flow dynamics and say, you know what, I, I, I get, uh, better perfusion to the overall, you know, segment of liver that you're treating or a couple segments of liver that you're treating, you know, in this position versus that position within the same artery, right? I mean, that's kind of what you're saying is that you can, you can kind of get a better feel for exactly where your uh, radioembolic is going to go um, once you're delivering, right? Yeah, exactly. And, and it's, it's educational, uh, at least from some extent, you know, you get a difference, you get to see the difference at the same vessel location and often the same injection rate with 50, 50 contrast for the mapping versus hundred percent for the, the, the treatment. Um, you get a little bit better CTA that way. And so you get to see, you know, how things look in terms of more of the angiographic appearance of it. It maybe give you a little bit different perspective on what the, uh, how vascular the tumor is. Um, and so it's, you know, it's, it's kind of an academic exercise and I acknowledge that on the front end, but again, repetition and it helps, it helps sort of beat the staff into, uh, and they're getting used to cone beam. That's good. As far as your delay time, as far as pushing delay times out to eight to 12 seconds, are you still getting good information as far as the arteries that you're working in? And, and by that, I mean, um, are you still getting good arterial pacification of the vessels to where if you, if you wanted to, there's some software that's out there that you can do a cone beam CT, but it also gives you this arterial information to where you can create if needed, a 3D roadmap um, of the, you know, uh, main uh, hepatic and, and the right and left hepatics and sometimes some segmental branches that, that may help you with, I don't know, either tortuous anatomy or difficult anatomy and, and getting where you need to go? Yeah, most of the time, yes. And some of the time, 
uh, no. And so some of the times it really, it really benefits you to get a proper, uh, angiographic phase and, and do a shorter x-ray delay. And I've definitely done that a couple of times. What I would say more, more than likely, or the majority mm-hmm. of the time you end up with, uh, with, you know, you sort of using the eight second delay, you end up with some persistent arterial opacification. And if you have any questions, and, th- and this is the main reason why I've never had a ton of interest in, in vessel tracking software, is you can usually use the the conventional 3D um, that that isn't rendered into CT format, and you can you can spin around and figure out which angle to visualize which artery is heading anterior, which artery is heading posterior. And I've 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 heard this technique described a pretty good bit in prostates, and you can see the uh, the arteries in a way that you don't necessarily need tracking software per se, but you can say, okay, I need to move it to and an angle, which I would otherwise never even think about, like an RAO 46, you know, I would right. move over to that. And then I can get, then I can get a hand run and say, okay, this is the vessel I need to get into. It's pretty clear based on my cone beam that I need to I get into this and spin it. And then I get into it and it's either verification or not. And so, um, yeah, so I think sometimes it, most of the time that's good enough, meaning you get enough, a good enough parenchymal phase and you get a little arterial opacification that it helps. Um, but that's kind of what works for us. The other thing I would say is you got to be a little bit careful in that if you're doing these eight second delays, at least early on when I was doing them, I would notice that I would see what I thought was a, a, a super duodenal branch or something heading sort of in the vicinity of the second portion of the duodenum. And I didn't know what to sure. make of it. It was kind of near the, you know, sort of near the, the hilum and I would get really confused and worried about it. And the more and more I've seen it, the more and more I realize that if you're using a more delayed x-ray time, a lot of times you'll see this sort of caudate venous return come back and these, or gallbladder cystic vein return. And okay. these, vein, these veins can look very confusing, but you're just seeing sort of early venous opacification and not a super duodenal. So if you, if you see that and you are confused, you can always bump the acquisition delay time down and, you know, do a four second delay and then feel better about it. And I've done that a few times. Okay. That's a good, that's a good point. I know that you mentioned it when we talked about it, but I just didn't want everyone else to miss it. And I know I'm kind of holding you to a certain injection rate that you may or may not use, or and I know that we all kind of eyeball it and then we may tweak it. But if you're in the the left hepatic and you're doing a left lobe treatment, you know, say segments two, three, and uh, four, what would, you know, it's hard to say the normal left hepatic artery, but what would be like a, a rough guess at uh, an injection rate that you would use if you were going to do a cone beam CT? I would say minimum. I would, I think what it really comes down to for me is if I'm doing the mapping, I'm probably going to want to opacify everything. And I can sure. usually, I can usually get away with that by doing more contrast over a longer period of time. If you know, to, to get good staining, and to make sure that I'm targeting everything in the left lobe. And so I would say a one second for the left lobe, maybe a one second or 1.5 seconds, what you should shoot for on the day of the treatment. I have, if I'm in an area where I could reflux and potentially end up in, you know, right gastric or something else concerning, then in those situations, if they're not coiled or if there's some artery I can't get into, then if I, if I get a one second, uh, injection rate and I don't see reflux and I don't see uh, perfusion to anything other than liver and tumor, then I usually feel really good about it with a slow hand injection using the therosphere. If I can get a 1.5, I feel even better. Okay. And how long would you carry that out? So it's like a one for 10 seconds or? Yeah. Yeah. One for 10. I usually do a standard 10 second injection. So yeah, one for 10 or 1.5 for 15. Okay. And then for the right hepatic, I think I think that earlier you said to 2.5. Yeah. Anywhere from maybe 1.5 to 2.5 for a whole right hepatic. Now again, the colorectals, sometimes they're one. Uh, if I can't get, and I had one the other day where I couldn't, I couldn't avoid reflux with a 0.5 injection rate. And, oh, wow. uh, and I sort of, I could, you know, I kind of was faced with the question of whether I use an anti reflux catheter or sort of what the plan is. But I ultimately decided that the vasculature was so pruned down that transarterial therapy was probably not likely to be really effective. And the right. and and so in those cases, in those cases, on a really rare occasion, I'll, I'll bail. Um, and I do. I kind of set. I feel like a lot of what I see on the cone beam is all anecdotal, but I, it does help me set expectations with how well I think somebody's going to respond. 
Sure. And so, and sorry to drill back down on the right of paddock. So let's say you're 1.5 to 2.5 and you, and you carry that out for, um, you may carry it out to what another 10 seconds, 20 seconds. Yeah. So 10 seconds typically, unless it's, um, you know, really, really slow flow and then a lower injection rate for a longer delay. But yeah, typically a, yeah, one for, for a right of paddock, uh, 1.5 for 15 or a 2.5 for 25 would be, uh, my go-to. Okay. Excellent. Um, and I know that you, you kind of referenced it just a second ago, but really what you're kind of going for and, and, you know, I don't want to micromanage everyone or, or give everyone so much that they're over advised, but really you're just looking for good anti-grade flow without reflux whenever you're doing the cone beam, right? Exactly. Yeah. And I would say if I'm in a segment and I'm planning a segmentectomy, a lot of times I'll up the injection rate and get reflux with the idea that, I kind of want to see where the reflux is going to go, um, sure. but also it allows me to sort of pressurize up the segment to make sure that I've got complete coverage. But yeah, the idea in a, in a standard low bar is to make sure that uh, that you got anti-grade flow with a reasonable injection rate. Okay, that's awesome. All right, well, Austin, that covers all my questions. Is there anything else you can think of to give people advice on cone beam CT? Man, that's it. I know there's been a lot of talk lately about uh, using cone beam for prostate embolization. Right. If, do you have any thoughts on that? I mean, I could tell you what I've heard and I don't have much experience on it, but just the way I practice, I, I would be a little uncomfortable um, trying prostates out without cone beam CT. Yeah. Yeah. And so we, we've done a very, very small handful of these in our lab and the program is sort of just getting off the ground right now. And, and I know there's a debate about conventional CTA pre-op versus bringing people in and, getting an on the table cone beam CTA and you see right. injection rates like a, like a half string contrast six for 60 um, with a, you know, a six second or, or a four second x-ray delay. And it gives you the effect of a, of a CTA. And if you have, if you have vessel tracking software, that might be the proper utility for it. Cause you start to see a little parenchymal enhancement in that situation. And, and I think that's in our lab, I'm eager to start that because we, uh, we can't get really good quality CTAs to evaluate the prostate. So that might be something worth looking into. That's I think on the, uh, on the list of things to, to sort of develop a, a protocol for on our end. No, and, and it actually might be worth talking to um, Ari Isaacson about um, he had, uh, I was doing, um, I was beginning to approach one of my, my first prostate artery embolization case and I was kind of looking for some, uh, guides about, you know, how certain people approach it. And Ari had this great video and, and I, and if I can link to it, I, I definitely will, or maybe I'll just reach out to him. He, he's done, I think a couple of podcasts with us. Um, but he had some great suggestions on, on terms of, you know, doing uh, a comb beam CT, but, you know, skipping the, the pre-op CTA and just going comb beam CTA, like from an aortogram or I've seen some people say that they just do it from, you know, uh, the left internal and getting an idea of the anatomy and which, uh, where the takeoff of the prostate artery is going to be and like the best angle to approach it to where you can really lay out the, the takeoff on the right obliquity. And Ari, you know, had this video and he was able to glean all kinds of information from this. Whenever I put it to practice, I, I don't think I was seeing all the things that he was seeing, but I did find it helpful in terms of, of picking the right obliquity to, to find the prostate artery. And, and I still confirmed everything with, you know, conventional DSA, but it was just nice to know that if I went to, you know, ipsilateral oblique 40 with 10 uh, caudal tilt, then, you know, that was where the takeoff was going to look the best. And so, yeah, I think that's, I think that's a real way to go. Um, and I know some people don't even use cone beam CT and, and uh, that may be every, uh, some other people's approach, but for me, I, I think it was helpful and it was a crutch that um, I, I don't even consider cone beam CT a crutch anymore. I just consider it just part of the tools and the tool belt that make thing makes life easier and gives you a little more confidence in one origin takeoffs and then non-target embolization accessories so or something that can get complex like prostate arteries. Yeah, I would completely agree. And it's a, it's a huge educational tool to learn the anatomy where, where branches you're seeing in two dimension are going in three dimension. And that's yeah. applicable really anywhere, I think. And, um, and so, yeah, I would say a couple of things. So prostate embolization is, is one, I think, a must-have uh, for a PAE program. 
Um, we've done a, a small handful of cases and we've really just sort of lacked motivation to scale this, but <laughs> we've done, uh, yeah, just to be honest, we've done gastrostomy tubes and we've, we've sort of ironed out a protocol where we get a referral with no cross-sectional imaging and yeah. we drop an NG tube and get an on the table cone beam, which I think is a really effective way of both feeling confident that you're not tracking through something you don't want to track through with your access, but also expediting care. And so cone beam is a, you know, is, is, is sort of got a budding role for that in our practice. Yeah. And so since we've mainly hammered the, uh, the cone beam CT for liver directed therapy, then I'll sort of recap my, the, the points that I think we've made here is that, so you've got a few variables. So acquisition time, I think as short as possible, makes it better. Uh, you, you want to minimize motion at the expense of photons, uh, contrast dilution. I go 50, 50 for mapping hundred percent for treatments. I spend everybody on every case, uh, contrast rate of injection. It just depends on, a lot of factors, but I base it off a hand injection and then I go for a right lobe, maybe two and a half as my standard and for a left lobe, one to one and a half uh, as my standard injection rate. And then delay time, it depends on how much anti-grade flow and how, how hypervascular and sort of what you're looking at. But in general, it's an eight second delay. Man, good, uh, good summary. Usually, uh, usually I'll do that. So, uh, thanks for, thanks for taking over there, Austin. Fantastic. Yeah, man. Um, I'm easy to get off track. I had to, I had to, I had to for myself. <laughs> All right. Well, I think that, uh, I think that about covers it. So we covered a lot of ground here today. Really, really excellent discussion. Guys, if you enjoyed uh, the show, enjoyed the podcast, um, there are a couple of easy ways to support us. And here they are. Um, first, take one second and press the subscribe button on whatever platform you're listening to, whether it's uh, iTunes, Stitcher, or Spotify. Uh, it just helps the platforms know that you value what we're doing and you're interested in getting our latest content as we're putting it out. Um, second, if you're getting a lot of value from these pod to, uh, if you're getting a lot of value from these podcasts, go to iTunes, leave us a short written review. It helps us in a lot of ways. We'd love the feedback. Um, so that wraps it up. Austin, again, thanks for coming in. We really appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Enjoyed it. <laughs>